Welcome to the Industrial Revolution, a time of invention, an era of equality, and an age of progress. Total Warhammer 3 has recently received a new faction, the Chaos Dwarfs, a race of industrialist gentlemen, raver techno demons, and a work ethic rivaled only by a Croatian sweatshop. Because today we'll be uniting all dwarf kind, whether willing or not, through the power of friendship, employee satisfaction, and 30,000 hobgoblins, we could selflessly spread the gift of employment. To start our campaign, we have Drazoath the Ashen, certified spell dude, and esteemed member of the Shadow Wizard Money Gang. Beginning our adventures of tyrannical desolation, we have three main goals. First, to become dwarves, the only dwarves, by confederating every dwarf faction on the map, from the neighboring Chaos Dwarf factions to the friendly lands of Thorgrim Grudgebearer. Goal number two is to survive a specific endgame crisis, and for goal number three, I'll reveal that later. As a faction, the Chaos Dwarves are relatively complicated, with five different resources, multiple settlement types, and a political system resembling Washington, D.C. So for that reason, I'll explain each mechanic as we go on. Entering our first battle, Drazoath starts with several unique things. First, a really cool hat, symbolizing his undying commitment to the Riz. Then we have guns, cooler guns, and their targets, our own orc employees. Across the way are the most disgusting creatures you've ever seen, unionized orcs, making ludicrous demands like only being shot on Wednesdays or food. Luckily, I am willing to negotiate. Chaos Dwarves have an army ability for artillery barrages, alongside ranged units equipped with actual laser rifles and other units who casually carry 12-gauge shotguns. After giving the strikers a very real chance to surrender, we'd won the very first battle of the campaign, and we'd only lost uh, six people. Because the Chaos Dwarves are such caring creatures, we absolutely love creating jobs, increasing our labor count and fueling our industry, the crux of the Chaos Dwarf economy. The simple explanation is that laborers mine raw materials, raw materials become armaments, and armaments increase unit capacity, so we can train more dwarf and mechanical units. Going to our recruitment, we could only field a max of two dwarf warriors, but using armaments to increase the capacity, now we can field up to three. Although labor troops are always uncapped, because it's not a casualty if it's not a person. Moving into our first settlement battle, we now possessed a real front line of heavily armored dwarf warriors. We still put the goblins in front. It's so brave of them to volunteer. After successfully brokering peace, we could claim the settlement. Here, Chaos Dwarves can establish cities as either outposts or factories. Outposts or where laborers dig up raw materials, whereas factories convert those into armaments. Because raw materials are used to upgrade our buildings, we establish the city as an outpost, building mines for our workers. Filling Drazuat's army with the pride of our nation, we research labor quotas and Stockholm Syndrome. Now that's the kind of company loyalty we reward. By marching over to Darkhold, we secured the last settlement of the province, flourishing the local job market and meeting our very first dwarf faction, Clan Helheim. And as you can see, they absolutely love us. Our faction also has military convoys, allowing us to send caravans to trade resources. Here we can exchange money, materials, and armaments, plus collect unique artifacts from each trade location. Returning to our settlements, we'd run into a slight problem, a labor shortage. Each turn we experience some slight employee turnover, usually just laborers finding better opportunities. Because the north was occupied by a much stronger Skaven faction, we need to recruit more workers in the south. Now I know this might say raiding stance, but that's just corporate jargon for going on LinkedIn. To fix the turnover problem, we built guard towers, keeping our employees safe from the outside world. While our recruiters acquired the finest elven talent firearms could scare, we'd also unlock the Tower of Zar. Here we can occupy seats for faction-wide bonuses at the cost of conclave influence, something we passively get from settlements and events. The thing is, every other Chaos Dwarf faction is also competing for the seats, and more seats allows us to progress up the tower for increasingly powerful bonuses. Things like summoning the Techno Gods, small nuclear bombs, and entirely free armies of Hobgoblin IRS agents. At the very top, our three final seats to commence a hostile takeover of almost every other Chaos Dwarf faction, so we need to get there before everyone else. For right now, we just unlocked a seat for some material embezzlement and returned to fixing our economy. With dwindling labor, our efficiency was only 69%, and the elves were starting to wonder why their population was mysteriously vanishing. Adding on to our misery was everyone's favorite neighbor, Tretch Craventail, declaring war, and Grimgore voicing his slight concerns with our business model. But at least we're not at war with Imric. All we've done so far is make jobs. I mean, come on, Imric. Think of the economy. For that reason, we recruited a second army of elite dwarf warriors who happened to be green and not have weapons or armor. Although the real saving grace was Tretch attacking my caravan, filled with Zeech, soul grinders, blunderbusses, and infernal guards. But while Tretch is incompetent, Imric is 
just as incompetent, trying to siege our capital from Drazuat. Even with his powerful dragon persona, in the grand game of rock, paper, scissors, the winner is usually gone. My master engineer stood in place shooting the dragon for five minutes, then escaping with the grace of a legless penguin. The rest of the battle was fairly normal, with goblins bravely fighting the urge to run away, shotgun blasts, decapitating elves, and the sexiest bombing I have ever seen. After we let the remaining enemies run away in peace, we still had the issue of two Skaven 20 stacks sieging our adjacent settlement. The Skaven armies were mostly Skaven slaves. How they could use such a barbaric institution, I will never understand. As the front of laborers broke, I decided that winning was impossible. But kiting for 22 minutes while abusing a single unit of hobgoblins to exclusively target surrendering soldiers, I will gladly do. 286 kills, well earned. A little trick you can do when desperate is to kill your own leader. That way you can recruit a fresh one with full health immediately, reinforcing the army without ending the turn and allowing the Skaven to be employed. Given their cities were undefended, we upheld the burden of enlightenment, claiming our first factory city. These turned raw materials into armaments and money, forming the backbone of our military economy. Filling in the inevitable gaps of our production is where the convoy system comes in, letting us trade for anything we're missing. The downside is that on occasion, they get robbed. Or they would if they didn't have garrisons. Ogres may be scary, but nothing is more frightening than a flying robo-cow. After defending the caravan, we also occupied the Skaven capital as a tower settlement, which is unlike either a factory or outpost. Towers produce conclave influence that can only be settled in provincial capitals. The downside is that neither factories nor towers use labor, so all of our 2024 laborers were in one province, leading to some minor issues like a full-scale revolution. To fix the issue, I built another mine, then sat down with our employees to just talk. And if this might seem like an OSHA violation now, don't worry, it only gets worse from here. Over the next dozen turns, we raided Imric with 2,000 unpaid interns, captured Tretch's last settlement, and ran into our very best friends. At the start of this campaign, I mentioned that we had three goals. First, to unite all dwarven factions. Second, to survive a specific endgame crisis. And third, a special mission I didn't share, which is making Thorgrim a little angry. As our third goal, I am going to get my relations as low as physically possible, and later in the game, it will be a thing of beauty. But right now, we have a minor issue. Is it overkill to use heavy artillery on Skaven slaves? Maybe. Did that stop me from winning the battle? Well, almost. Following Tretch's Gallipoli, he was intercepted by a different army in range of our garrison, allowing us to recruit a single laborer. Incompetent, cowardly, lazy, terrible leader? Congratulations, you are now in charge of human resources. Tretch's attack did expose a general weakness in our armies, with our flimsy front line and lack of mobility. To compensate, I recruited more blunderbusses, gave Drazuath a new mount, and used the Hellforge for the first time. Instead of using armaments to increase unit capacities, we can also upgrade them by group. For now, we gave our dwarf melee units frenzy, and later we get access to even better upgrades for each other kind of unit. To show off our new prowess, I was overjoyed to find a beastman faction had spawned inside my settlement, leading to one of my units of Infernal Guard getting 403 kills and allowing us to diversify our labor. With newly upgraded mines, Grom World Tip drills, and an increasing demand for real estate, our armies began to encircle the Southern High Elves. What I wasn't expecting was for them to attack out mid-recruitment. With Great Eagles, and dragon princes, their army was scary, but we had their direct counter. 240 midgets with shotguns. Melting the great eagles in seconds, we countered their archers with Drezuet's newfound ability to spit fireballs from his mouth. Even so, our front line was mostly hobgoblins, forcing us to kite back with the blunderbusses. Utilizing our array of strengths like firebombing, we reenacted the running of the bulls and regrouped while our infernal guard held the line. On paper, they may be ranged units, but 158 melee kills would disagree. Over the course, of 20 minutes, Drazuat single-handedly kited and cycle-charged into a win, then marched on the nearest city and did it again. Similarly, our other army besieged a different city, claiming it at the cost of a few casualties. Interrupting our conquest was the arrival of Big Boy Imric, who decided now was the time to get absolutely dumpstered. While our empire expanded southwards, it also grew on the Tower of Zog. Because enough seats had been claimed, we could move up the tower to the Tier 2 seats, with even stronger bonuses and getting us closer to confederating entire factions. But for now, we focused on developing our infrastructure at Crookback Mountain, claiming the first tier 2 tower seat, and finally wiping Imric off the map. To account for our expanding army, we researched the groundbreaking technology called Feeding Our People Less, then attempted to fight Drazuat's main quest battle against a small force of 6,000 undead. It's good to know that Drazuat has his priorities in order. The first wave is mostly weaker undead, black knights, skeletons, and crypt ghouls, and while some might say shotguns are dishonorable, those people are probably dead. 
With the Vampire Count armies, a smoldering pile of ash, a second army of Tomb Kings entered as reinforcements meeting exactly the same fate, and triggering a third and fourth army to reinforce as well. The only problem with having an army of gunners is trying not to shoot your own units, which I solved by not trying at all. By the end, there was only a single group of Tomb Guards, and one colossal Hyro Titan that lasted an impressive six seconds. Just one of our blunderbusses ended the battle with a rather tame 329 kills, earning Drazuak his quest item and letting us recruit the Immortals, a bunch of cyborg dwarves. We also befriended a local ogre faction, defriended that same ogre faction, and moved further south to attack the Skaven. It's not like their garrison can be that, um... No, no, I, I wasn't trying to invade. I was, I was just... That wasn't me. No sooner afterward did Kolek declare that he wanted to be our friend. Surprisingly, the Chaos Dwarves are pretty well liked by uh, a certain clientele. Because we'd taken out every accessible enemy in our homeland, it seemed like a good decision to venture east towards Cathay. But little did I know, we would run into the most horrifying, evil, and utterly villainous antagonist the Warhammer universe has ever known. Helman Gorst. Our only redeeming factors was us eliminating the Ogre Leader, boosting our income significantly, and decking Drezueth out in the supreme drip of six legendary items. Surrounding his main settlement with both our armies, we could exploit a small oversight of the Vampire Counts, because they have zero ranged units, meaning Drezueth can just fly over the city and destroy every single tower and defense that gets built. So instead of advancing into the city, we just put all the blunderbusses lined up on the edge to draw the defenders out. The rest of the fight was exactly what you'd expect. To make sure we weren't attacked from the opposite side of the map, I tried to bribe the Skaven. They rejected free money. Apparently, the only thing that outweighs greed is spite. While I prayed the Skaven would stay in their hole, I caught out a vulnerable settlement from Gorst, which got occupied as an outpost. The thing is, its natural resource produced armaments. Need a cheap, readily available supply of coals for the furnace? Just burn down the forest! What's it gonna do? Get up and walk away? To remedy this, I can actually convert outposts to factories, or vice versa, which destroys all the infrastructure, but changes the settlement type. In line with developing our provinces, we researched tech to help the average citizen, like tyrannical decrees and 20-hour shifts, then began building our first tier 5 settlement to unlock our best units. The best part is that when the building is almost done, we can rush the construction to instantly complete it, at definitely no cost whatsoever. We were fortunate that Helmut Gorst had met his match, a giant blob of green flesh, and that the Skaven we'd trespassed against were too paranoid to move. Sadly, Gorst's vacation eventually came to an end, with one of his armies trying to siege our homeland. Gorst himself just kind of spontaneously died. We took out another stack of ogres, and Drazueth finally had some spare skill points. One of his learned skills targets an area, then peacefully explodes an entire volcano. But the spell costs a literal kidney of mana, unless you're Drazueth, because one of his abilities practically halves the cost, plus certain techs and items reduce it even further. As a Chaos Dwarf, Drazueth is also a master of diplomacy with all of the respectable factions. We gained a defensive alliance with Kolek, trade with Norska, non-aggression packs with other Chaos Dwarves, and the Skaven promised to consider not killing us. Alliances give us the ability to construct outposts, allowing us to recruit a limited set of units from other factions. The only thing that can make blunderbusses even stronger is backing them up with chemical weapon teams. By increasing our influence, we could unlock the second to last row of seats in the Tower of Zaw, rapidly closing the gap to instant confederation of the other Chaos Dwarves. Not to mention that filling out the seats in the tower gives every Chaos Dwarf faction bonuses, like a higher caravan capacity. Despite us taking a sizable amount of Gorse settlements, not everything was going so peachy. Vampiric and Nurgle corruption were spawning rebel armies, lizardmen ones, and that caravan we sent lasted a single turn. Why hello? What can I do for you, fine gentlemen? Our allies were handling Grimgore's main army, but Helmund Gorst was riding around the ocean in his vampiric submarine. We were fighting zombies, and were somehow taking more casualties than them. To solve this problem, I found several hundred involuntary volunteers to rush the construction of our tier 5 settlement, so we could start getting higher level units. Infernal Guard, more techno beasts, and a sprinkling of German artillery trains. I also needed to recruit a third army, because the ogres were sieging us in the north. Something very special about the Chaos Dwarves is that they don't have supply lines. Normally, for each army you recruit, your upkeep increases for all armies, but for the Chaos Dwarves, it remains the same. That means there's no penalty to recruiting more and more armies, but you're still limited by the recruitment caps on your actual units. Which is why it was great that I had 4,187 armaments, allowing me to increase the caps on just about everything, then use the Hellforge to give our units even more ammo. While the ogre problem was boiling 
fell into a crisis, Drezorath was forced to march north to save the capital, then reconquer our northern outpost. Luckily, our fruitful alliance with Kolek cultivated in repeatedly declining to fight Cathay. My ethics may be flexible, but even I'm scared of the Great Dragon and Helmund Gorst, because somehow he is still alive. Kinda. So instead of losing two settlements to him, I decided to gift the other to Kugath for a benign friendship and $7,000. The following turn, he asked if I would join his wars. Obviously not. After a few turns of forced recruitment, Drazwath encountered Grimgor's faction. Their army consisted of trolls, goblins, and a lurge spooter. Ours, on the other hand, six groups of shotguns, four laser snipers, and a unit of literal terminators. Drazwath's skills also reduced the cost of spell casting, so we just spawned in a volcano. Then another. Then another. Then another. I mean, I could only do it like 20 times per battle. And it's not like we need them either. I mean, we do have alternate means. After the fight, we made peace with Helmund Gorst. And by peace, I mean extorted all his money for a worthless settlement because our attention had turned to the ogre, still rampaging through our land. While peace was an option, I immediately recognized their leader, Santa Claus. The last thing we need in our market is child labor because I can't beat those prices. Santa had also confederated the Southern Ogre faction, forcing us to fight a difficult siege. Here is their army and here is mine. Immediately afterwards, Santa requested a ceasefire, and while I didn't directly decline, it was strongly implied. And now that we weren't fighting Gorst anymore, our southern army was able to take a capital city, then use Conclave influence to boost it up to tier 3. But the unrest caused a rebellion. In the province with Chaos Corruption, Vampiric Corruption, and Nurgle Corruption, it only made sense that the rebels were Skaven. To deal with them, we recruited a Dreadquake Mort. All you need to know about that is that in this auto-resolve, it killed half the entire army. Both armies. And just in time for the Skaven to run headfirst into a garrison, get a concussion, then die. Seeing what we had done to his Skaven brethren, Queek had decided now was perfect for a defensive alliance. That meant now we could recruit Chaos units from Kolek, Nurgle units from Kugath, and Skaven units from Queek. Plus Wolfric, Throg, and the King of Peace himself, Scarbrand, all accepted military access. So we could begin building our coalition against the dwarves, named the Chaos Host of Despoiling Entities, also known as Chode. But before we could solidify our alliance, Helmund Gorst declared declared war yet again, and this time Drazwath was busy fighting the ogres in the north, leaving a single army to defend the south. We'd also been ignoring our industry, so it was fortunate we'd put our best employee on the case. Because the south was isolated, our single army was stuck under siege, giving us the perfect opportunity to test our Dreadquake Mortar. You could probably guess the first target. Mounted on a train and loaded by an ogre, the Dreadquake Mortar is surprisingly mobile, and if that wasn't enough, it has a flamethrower. Although we took some minor hobgoblin losses, the mortar effectively outkited outgunned the undead, ending the battle with 440 kills, some of which might have even been enemies. With the orcs coming down from the north, Drazorath was able to continue fighting Santa's elves, all afforded by our occupation of the Ivory Road, which is a lot like the real Ivory Road if you replaced all the money with obesity. But the conquest of our eastern employees was about to get a whole lot more complicated when Karakazul of the western dwarves decided to declare war. Queek, as a fellow chode, rushed to our aid, but Karakazul quickly got on top of our cities. I did try and make peace to no Vale, while Gorst's faction was also invading, and to the north a new challenger had appeared, Grimgor Ironhide. All in all, we were beset on every side, and only had three armies. If we didn't do something drastic, we'd be unable to protect our valuable assets. So step one of saving our employees, I sacrificed 600 laborers for money. That way I could recruit an additional army with actually decent units, backed up by Nurgle Plague Bears and Chaos Warriors. The Ogres and I had also decided to postpone their annihilation, right as Grimgor made his move. With a fully kitted legend legendary lord, two 20-stack armies, multiple regiments of renown, four groups of black orcs, and three arachnorok spiders, I had to use my special move auto result, killing the entire army without losing a single group. Our victory did come at the cost of losing a separate settlement, this time an army of alcoholic dwarves, also known as regular dwarves. Our newly recruited fourth army was nearby the defense, with mostly cheap laborers, but minimum wage employees are the ideal soldier for artillery, because I'd added two hell cannons and the ice forge legion. Hell cannons are powerful enough that they come in groups of one, and are extremely expensive. The ice forge legion is exactly that, times four, so we exploited the dwarves greatest weakness walking at a brisk pace, forcing their army to march across the wasteland beset by holy napalm. Their greeting came in the form of 1,600 naked men, who we also bombed. Surprisingly, our most potent weapon was nothing more than the power of friendship. At last, we took the settlement with only minor humanitarian violations and earned the grand prize of getting sieged again next turn, then did the whole thing again with similar results, gaining us the very first dwarf laborers. Let no one say we aren't a diverse company. A major issue we were facing was an economic 
pandemic one because we're only making negative one thousand dollars caravans were helping a little but they were dwarfed by a different problem the dwarves by taking settlements from Karakazul, it was apparent Thorgrim would declare war on us. Eventually, Grimgore had resurfaced in the north, and the Gorskmobile was back in action. But maybe we could team up with the dwarves. Let me stop you there. While Drazrath could fight Thorgrim and Verzag, we didn't have an army in position for Grimgore. But what if I told you we could spawn one through our special ability as Chaos Dwarves? Corporate lobbying. Because we'd banked a total of 1,000 Conclave influence and had unlocked the final tiers of the Tower of Tsar. Taking our very first seat, and confederating, we were given the small prize of a maxed out capital, an extremely developed province, and one full 20 stack of tier 5 units, next to a second. But the real battle was further south. Grimgore's full might versus the finest naked mushrooms. One hell cannon was the best we had, along with two groups of natural medicine users. Hell cannon projectiles can be manually controlled, so I skillfully steered it into a tree. Trust me, this is much harder than it looks. Stationary targets are much easier to hit, like these target dummies disguised as goblins. Throwing Grimgore's sacrificial lambs, our leader ran as fast as he could, which to be fair, is not very fast. The great clown off had begun, with Grimgore exercising his national speed walking titles against an obese short man while shouting, you're next. The balance of power was our whole army versus Grimgore and a single black orc. After 10 minutes chasing our leader around in circles, he was finally felled by some goblins throwing pointy sticks. So with Grimgore beaten, we employed him as Tretch's new secretary, allowing our newly annexed armies to rampage across the ogres. Now all of of this is great and all, but maintaining the military industrial complex requires something we seem to be lacking. Minus $9,000 per turn. These armies we confederated are 5,000 upkeep each, and the new cities barely generate any money. Our wages were so low, our employees were actually paying us, and we'd taken all the money from their 401ks that definitely existed. In the end, I decided some minor layoffs were necessary, so in a single turn, I sold, I transferred over 1,000 laborers to other branches, and when bankruptcy approached, next Next turn, I pulled myself up from my bootstraps and sold our employees again. If you're wondering whether this is a good plan, let me assure you now. It's not. To get more laborers, we needed to win more battles. But in order to win more battles, we needed more laborers. The positive of stealing several armies via political annexation was that we were now strength rank one, which did literally nothing. Helman Gorst, a man almost as pretentious as a YouTuber making a big deal out of their face reveal. Him trashing our settlements sucked, but we could easily make up the lost income at the negligible cost of a few thousand human sacrifices per turn. But you can only throw so many people into a near bottomless chasm before someone starts to notice, and that's something Someone is Thorgrim. After 85 turns of insults, intrigue, and incineration, it was finally time for the great civil war between the proud dwarves and whoever that is. But perhaps more importantly, Mr. Gorst finally made a mistake. Gorst. Oh, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. He's dead. Of course, his inconvenience would outlive him with another vampire army besieging the east. Queek had built his outpost here, giving an additional garrison of three Skaven slaves. As soon as they hit the enemy lines, they die, then ran, in that order. Also, on an unrelated note, our neighboring Chaos Dwarves mysteriously vanished into my labor force. Our economy was now only mostly in shambles, and my 6,000 sacrificed laborers were propping the whole thing up. Fortunately, we were starting to employ them in my favorite location, a literal vault. Volcano. We were even making 112 influence per turn, letting us confederate more factions, gaining a new province, legendary lord, and putting us directly adjacent to the dwarves. It also got us closer to our newest member of the Chode, Archaon, the only sometimes chosen, along with a random demon wow. faction, giving us access to the entire roster of all four chaos factions. Back in the east, Saint Nicholas decided to surprise me with a thoughtful gift, pulling all my defensive allies into the war, then losing every single battle against us, the chaos dwarves, to our units, the Skaven. Elvin Gorst died to Kugath, and we scored enough influence to confederate the final Chaos Dwarf faction. By uniting all the Chaos Dwarves and with Thorgrim confederating his dwarves, that meant we just had two goals left. Survive the endgame crisis and beat the United Dwarves once and for all. Our secondary plan of pissing everyone off was also going well. Gorst had negative 227 relations, Cathay boasted negative 277, but above and beyond was Thorgrim at negative 498 and trending to negative 1000. Surely it can't get much lower than that. Taking an overview of everything, most of our enemies
enemies in the east had been completely dealt with, leaving us with our only remaining enemy, the dwarves. We temporarily pulled back to regroup, while raiding the outskirts of their land to replenish our labor. The great five-turn plan had revitalized our economy, bringing us to an impressive $18 of income. Speaking of raises, here is stupid amounts of money. One of our final tax is unilateral agreements, which in contract law is like a one-sided obligation that as soon as we start doing it, the other party can no longer back out. All I have here is a signature and someone who hasn't read the fine print giving plus 5% trade income for every convoy ever completed. And let me tell you, we've been doing a lot of employee trading. The Tower of Tsar now also resembles the ideal democratic system because I own every seat. Democracy feels great, but only when you win. Because there's nothing else to spend influence on, every time I take a tower city, we just occupy it at max level. With our lands becoming increasingly centralized, we returned our gaze to the dwarves. Queek needed help in the south, so I decided who better to defend him than Scarbrand the Exile. In the north, we tailored our armies specifically to fight dwarves. My master plan involves hiding all my units in the forest and having a dreadquake mortar drive around for 10 minutes. Eventually they found my army, ending the battle in a climactic chase. One of our army abilities also spawns these friendly fellows anywhere on the map. By the second fight, I had perfected this strategy. I call it Nice Army. Summons techno demons. Several dwarf armies were wiped out with the power of the rave. Now it's no surprise the dwarves were losing, both in the north and south. Shockingly, we were actually making money and were progressing towards complete and utter domination quite nicely. Now surely nothing will happen next turn that will completely stop Oh look, we just got a letter. I wonder who it's from. Verzag, great green prophet, renowned union leader, and original author of the Communist Manifesto. Verzag has decided to decline employment by starting a global uprising. In 10 turns, the workers of the world will unite. And most frighteningly, they are now British. We need to rush to the dwarven provinces to prepare defenses, because Verzag's armies spawn in the west, on the left side of the mountains. And defenses do cost money, or in our case, another round of mass sacrifices. Right now, I have $111. But after a few clicks, it's 30,000. Farragate Peaks, Vallejo Sorrow, and Black Crag fell to Drazoeth and Du Bois, forming the bulwark of our defense against the endgame crisis. I was also gonna finish off Gorst until I realized he was friends with all of China. Ah, yes, Twisted Necromancers, welcome to the PRC. Of course, that didn't stop me from stacking 700 raiding goblins on his capital, prompting his immediate offensive war declaration, meaning Cathay wasn't pulled in. And remember how I've been making some allies? <laughs> With only three turns left until the crisis, we built Dreadquake Mortars, upgraded garrisons, and recruited more armies like Zatan the Black's elite squad, 3,000 Hobgoblin IRS agents. Sacrifices were in full swing, a single dwarf got lost in the underway, and Kugath handled Gorst with his extensive knowledge of war. Finally, we were upon the last turn before the crisis. Zatan and Astrogath had armies nearby, while Drazwath's blunderbuss death stack took the lead. And as the turn ticked over, 10 maxed out Savage Orc armies with Arachnorok spiders feral wyverns, and droves of heavily armored black orcs. An overview painted the situation. We had allied Vlad, Scarbrand, and Queek, surrounding both the orcs and dwarves. If we could contain them here, both would be eliminated at once, allowing us to occupy Karazakarak. But one turn in, and I immediately saw a problem. Four greenskin armies were heading to Drazoath, which we'd prepared for. But another four armies were going north, and there was only one target for them to take. If they reached the dwarven capital, it would deny us its occupation. Luckily, Drazoath caught this first army away from the the pack. Their army consisted of two Arachnorok spiders, multiple giants, and masses of infantry. By the end of the battle, not a single unit made it to the front line. At least, a lot. Nothing to lose but your chains? I wouldn't be so sure. Our next battle was identical and ending in a similar result, but we didn't have enough quality ranged units to pass around, forcing me to explore other alternatives. As bad as these goblins seem, they are exactly that bad. Taking multiple stacks to actually do anything. But Chaos Dwarves don't have supply lines. So I recruited seven armies in one turn while my income was completely unaffected. Who would have guessed that the greatest WA on the planet would be defeated by 7,000 Hobgoblins? So with the Marxist Orcs defeated, that left only the Dwarven capital occupied by Thorgrim and a second army, which we lightning strike with a small line of goblins. Bringing together our most stacked armies, we had Drazuad's Doomstack, an entire army of Techno Demons, and most important, Importantly, our chodes. Every ally of the Chaos Alliance had brought their own might to bear. Vlad's Vargeis, Kugat's Plague Bearers, Scarbrand's Bloodletters, and one Holy War Shrine from each Chaos God, plus units from our other 10 allies. So when a reinforcing Dwarf Army flanked, Wolfric had it handled. Not to mention Queek's contribution, poisoning the water supply, breaking down the front door, 
we finally had our grand 1v1 with Thorgrim versus Drazoath and a few friends. Then I pulled everything back and decided to engage Thorgrim in a fair fight. With the dwarves routed and Kara as a Karak defenseless, this was our golden opportunity to unite dwarf kind. But Thorgrim had been a worthy adversary and his people had fought valiantly. So instead of eliminating the faction and wiping Thorgrim off the map, we struck a deal. I leave you alone, you leave me alone, and together, we watch 127,000 hobgoblins raid your land. Positive relations, plus eight. Negative relations, minus six thousand.